So, if the two pills created to help women to manage their sexual desire cleared the FDA's approval hurdles, they wouldn't arrive in pharmacies until 2016. But these drugs have already shown more promise than previous pharmacological attempts to piece together the complex chemical and physiological puzzle of women's arousal. Because, as it turns out for women, getting their mojo back with a Viagra of their own isn't quite as simple as popping a little blue diamond. Think about it. For men who wanted to get that old thing back, Viagra was the key to jump-starting an automatic transmission. I mean, it's a matter of repairing the mechanics of one basic part. Get that up and running and voila, you're ready to ride. For women, you're trying to find the key to operate a manual transmission. There are a lot more moving parts for the ladies, and they all have to be working together in sync, or else you are going nowhere fast. Joining me today to talk the pharmacology and the politics of women's sexual desire is Dr. Hilda Hutcherson, clinical professor of obstetrics and gynecology at Columbia University and the author of Pleasure, A Woman's Guide to Getting the Sex You Want, Need, and Deserve, and Jonathan Metzel, professor of psychiatry at Vanderbilt University and author of Prozac on the Couch, Prescribing Gender in the Era of Wonder Drugs. And still with me, although <laughs> they more might be out of and Carmen Wong Ulrich. Okay. Doctor, should, should we be excited about these new drug possibilities? Well, yes, I, I think we should. I mean, you think about Viagra. It was on the fast track. Yep. It got through the mm -hmm. FDA so fast. But when it comes to women's sexuality, we're a little more cautious. Mm -hmm. Do we really want women walking down the street, hitting on every man that right. she happens to come in, in contact with? No, of course we <laughs> don't want that. But there are many, many women in this country in great relationships. Everything's wonderful. They love their husbands. They love sex when they have it. But something's not working. In up here mm -hmm. so that they actually want to have sex so they want to enjoy that with their their partners and so when you describe it as something not working up here I wonder Jonathan is it something biochemical that we ought to be addressing with with a pill or is this something that's not working up here I mean part of what was interesting to me about that New York Times magazine article is apparently women want sex just fine as long as it's a new partner right. the issue is like <laughs> they, they get bored you know something we're not at all shocked about when we say men get bored right that's why like the cover of every single you know magazine for women is how to keep him excited uh -huh. what a man wants right he wants you naked with a sandwich I mean right that's so, so is there is there something that are, are we trying to solve a cultural issue with a pharmacological intervention? Well, it turns out that it's quite a bit more complicated than it, than it seems, even yeah. from that article, which I thought was really interesting, because there's definitely a long history of trying to medicalize mm. women's desire. And this goes back from psychoanalysis and the kind of idea of kind of the women as the dark continent or what do women want to... I thought that was Africa. Yeah, well, that's, <laughs> that's, that's true. That's true. Yeah, there's, there's a lot of continents going on there. And then, um, you know, everything from kind of popular lore, like, oh, let's just put some Spanish fly in the water and mm -hmm. everything's going to go from there to, um, you know, when Milltown first came out, the first uh, tranquilizing drug, the people thought it was a drug to cure frigidity, women's kind of mar marital, you know, having pain or not having, uh, not having sex with their husbands. And then more recently, Pfizer has put billions of dollars into trying to kind of, um, you know, make this women's Viagra. And as you say, it's, it's like there's a mechanical issue and there's a kind of, you know, it turns out it's more, more, more complicated for women. And so I would just say that, I, that history teaches us to be wary. Uh, of drugs for women's desire. That there's a long history of medicalizing things that are more cultural than they are biological. And, and, and I wonder if there's also, I mean, we've been talking about the kind of power issue associated with women as breadwinners and all that, but I also wonder if there isn't, as you point out, a kind of fear when you said, we don't want some you know, women walking down the street hitting on every man. Well, <laughs> why? Like, why do we have a particular crazy, angst about that? Crazy. Yeah. I, you know, here's, here's my point. One, um, I think we just tied. <laughs> we're just tired, so that's yeah, why right, we're, we're, we're earning the money. We're yeah. working, we're cleaning. We're the, the, you know the guys keep try to keep up, please, with yeah. helping us out, so that we can focus on you and enjoy it. But also, too, I have to ask the doctors, I mean, how much of this is a cultural component? Because I mm. feel like, you know, American culture, we were talking about this, is, is like weird. It's this puritanical, mm. strange, especially the idea of marriage and being a mother. And right, a woman. you're supposed to because, be. But because in other cultures, I'll bring up Latin culture, for example, as a Latina, there is no real conflict mm. between 
being a mother and retaining your sexuality and being a wife and still being sexy. That's like a very normal thing. Mm -hmm. I grew up that with my mother, so it's handed down. But is American culture a big part of what's going on up here? I certainly see a, a lot of women, and this is my specialty as a gynecologist, yeah. and I see lots of women who feel guilty about wanting to have sex. They've been told about wanting to have about it. wanting it, about desiring it. Because if you're a good girl, oh. mm. right. you right. don't desire it. Right. And you, you in just, some parts of the country, you don't even enjoy it. But um, I, I don't know, because I, I'm sorry, I guess sad. maybe I'm more in Carmen's camp on this, because isn't this partly, I just suspect that this pill was invented by a frustrated man it's who was like, maybe I could just it's it's actually, pill. yeah, yeah the book was, was written by right, an actual right. and then the, because the yes. thing is, I mean, you know, I don't know, I just think in normal sort of ordinary life, you don't need a pill, you know, the cure for this is a vodka and a clean kitchen. Yeah. You know what I mean? Like, yeah. But the clean kitchen is not a small point. But I mean, a man helping you clean it, you know, clean the kitchen and bring me a vodka. There's an actual thing about, like, so I'm wondering in part if it is connected to the fact that um, that when we are when we are power sharing in in work and everything else and then we're doing the second everything shift else. right it, it is it can be hard to concentrate on intimacy if when you look up there's the pile of laundry right in the corner so is this and, and that won't be solved right the pile of laundry won't be solved from the from the pill right yes but there are some women and I agree yes. with you for the majority of women if Hubby goes into the kitchen and cooks and cleans and put baby to bed Rawr. while you're in the bathtub. <laughs> you know, you're taking your bubble bath and, right. and waiting for him. Then, yeah, the sparks fly. But there is a mm -hmm. small subset of women where all of that's happening. And they Hubby's still, doing yeah. everything. He's perfect. He's gorgeous. Mm -hmm. He smells good. You know, and he's technically very good. Mm -hmm. Everything's wonderful. But something's not clicking mm -hmm. here. It's just not happening for them. And for those women, what do we do? John. Well, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> this is really fun. I'm just sitting here. <laughs> no, I, I, I love Joey's point that if there was a pill that would do the laundry, that yes. that would solve mm -hmm. all the other problems. I think that's a, mm -hmm. a, that's a terrific point. But I would just say that there's an issue about how medicalization works, the medicalization of mm -hmm. sex works, in that when, when Viagra first came out, for example, it was billed in exactly the same way. It was like a pill to cure relationships, and they mm -hmm. had old older elderly people you know dancing together and it's right, like right. oh it's not it's not going to be this thing and it turned out in the five year period all of a sudden they were marketing it as a club drug and it was becoming right, this right kind now. of thing so medicalization it, it generally works this way and that it starts off as you know let's fix relationships which that new york times article mm -hmm. was all about and over time as as the market widens you know it, it's like oh we can we can you know combine it with red bull in a club right. and all that kind of you stuff know, it, i, yes. I want to come i want to come to exactly some of these cultural questions and our anxieties about the issue of mama's baby and papa's maybe when we come back and ladies don't feel ashamed for liking <laughs> That's all right. <laughs> right when we come back. I like it. <laughs>and talking about the politics of women's sexual empowerment. And it, it does feel to me like um, the question of whether or not there will be social sort of collective support for this depends a lot on the women that we are imagining taking it at the moment that we're thinking about it. So I like your point that there's this dichotomy in Western culture sometimes between the Madonna and the whore and this yes. idea that if you are, if you're married and a mother, you're supposed to suppress those moments. And my bet is that lots of married men would be excited about this drug for their wives and terrified about it for their teenage daughters right right, yeah. right? and so like our, because we do fear certain kinds of women's sexual awakening and that sort of thing mm -hmm. well it's, it's very interesting because we tell teenage girls not to have sex and not to think about it and to suppress their sexuality and then when they get married we tell them Woohoo, you're supposed yeah, to all up. of a sudden be the whore in, in, the, in the bedroom. And that doesn't always happen for women. Sometimes you can't make that transition from being this good girl to being always ready for your, your husband in the bedroom. And that sometimes can cause problems in relationships. And that's why we're looking for an easy fix. Is this primarily a heterosexual problem? Is this primarily a thing that is going on with wives and husbands? Or do we also see this in same-sex couples? And, and, and if it is in same-sex couples, is it primarily in, uh, with women who are in same-sex couples? Or do men also experience this kind of long-term reduction of desire for one another? Well, over as time? a gynecologist, I see it in my lesbian couples mm -hmm. as well. Is after 
a certain period of time of monogamy, mm -hmm. they lose desire, and it's called bed death, I mm -hmm. think is the, the term Lesbian that's used. Death. Yeah. But to, to your point about the whole kind of cultural, how you're raised to be the good girl and all that, I think that's a real issue. And actually, to be raised embracing your sexuality and knowing its power and also being able to enjoy it, yep. I think yes. is a really powerful thing for young girls to understand, because in that way, it is yours. You do own it. No one else does. And therefore, you will stand up for it. And you will be a real part of the process, mm -hmm. if I may say, yep. that you're present, you're there, and you can enjoy it. And to me, you know, my daughter's only six, but yes. Yes, I fear it, but I'm going to be completely realistic yeah, and assume absolutely. that she's going to do it, and I want her to know that it is her right to enjoy. Well, it. And, and Carmen, you know, if, just don't get pregnant, right? Don't get pregnant. pill. That's don't get pregnant. But, but that, look, that's actually part of that. That's. I wonder if that's part of it. So when you say, you know, to be a young woman, not who necessarily uses her sexuality all the time, but who, no, no, no. but who has it, right, and who has a sense who of control over it, it, right? But connect that to the fact that they, that young women are growing up in a rape culture, right. where, where in fact they don't control their own sexuality, where they are constantly in circumstances that are predatory, there might also be a desire to suppress or cover sexuality, right. in part for personal safety. And not only well. that, but I worry about, and when you talk about this being a pharmacological sort mm -hmm. of answer to mm -hmm. a social problem, I do worry about it. We talked a little yeah. bit about, about that in the break. You know, how, how do you get this drug? Is it something that young people can get their hands on? Could mm -hmm. it be abused in the sense that it's given to girls or slipped to girls when they don't know it in order to enhance their sexuality? Um, and then could it come up in terms of, of rape? Mm -hmm. if somebody was taking the drug. I mean, it, I worry about the abuse of it because, as you said, all of these drugs that start out as sort of a solution to a problem, there's always potential for abuse. I'm wondering about that, too. Well, I, I think that's a, a very real issue, and, and certainly, I mean, it, it um, you know, especially given the way that this drug seems to be kind of coded, something about, like, you know, slip it to a woman in a bar or something like that. Yep. Um, it, it, I do think that that's something I worry about. But the flip side is that they're very often, I mean, I think we learn a lot in our culture about the debates we have about these drugs, mm -hmm. far in excess of what the drugs actually do. Yep. So I remember when Prozac first came out, right. people were really worried that this was a, and people really thought that this was a drug that was going to restore men's virility. <laughs> and certainly um, with, with, with um, you know, Viagra, I think, you know, using your terminology, there was this sense of, oh, my God, it's going to change everything. Men really are going to be running out in the street and having sex with, like, sandwiches and stuff like that. <laughs> <laughs> No, no, no. They don't want the sandwich to have sex with. They want the sandwich at... We'll talk later, Jonathan. But the, the, point, the point I'm trying to make is that actually it's a, it, it, it sparks a cultural debate yeah. about issues that oftentimes is in excess of what the drugs actually do. So I haven't seen evidence mm. that at least this particular drug is going to be like this, this huge radical thing. Instead, I think it's going to be a piece of the puzzle about talking about sexuality, yeah. which is an important conversation to have. Would you be ready to prescribe this to your, to your um, uh, patients, particularly the ones who come in concerned you know, about I lack of lust. I don't know that much about yeah. the medication at this point. It hasn't been approved. But if there were a medication for a specific group of women mm -hmm. where everything else in their lives is wonderful, in their relationship, everything's great, they enjoy sex, it's just something missing up here, mm -hmm. perhaps I would prescribe it. And to, to your point, it doesn't seem like the kind of medication where you slip it to a young girl and all of a sudden she's going to be like, right, 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 right. God, I have sex. Right, I right. Have it, I, have. <laughs> I don't think that's, good. I don't think that's what would happen. Right. I think it's something where you would be more uh, available open and, and open to it. Yeah, right. well, receptive. Just, well, to uh, your look, partner. so uh, what I will say is until, until it is available, there are always. Toys. Yeah, and vodka. Too. And, and, and vodka. there's there's and toys, vodka, vodka and tequila. clean kitchens. <laughs> Thank you to Hilda Hutchinson and to Jonathan Metzl, also to Carmen Wong Ulrich and to Joy Reid. You guys have been so fun. You can sit at Nerdland all the time. We are not done yet. Up